very first main stage of the Global Youth Forum during this impactful youth program, the World Food Forum 2023. Thank you all for being here. We're so happy to see you. I want to know, first and foremost, where are some of you from? Tell me, tell me, just shout it out. Jamaica. Big up. Ah! <laughs> Had to be the first, because, you know, Jamaica, number one. Um, where else are you guys from? Kenya. Kenya? Brazil? USA? Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. I'm so happy to see you guys. It's wonderful. We have some exciting stuff ready for you today. Some fantastic speakers coming in, and I'm just really looking forward to it. So, first and foremost, we're here today to listen to the stories of youth from all over the world, like you guys are. And it is, I guess it's our privilege and our honor to be here amongst youth. That's the reason we are here, right? Right? This is where you're supposed to say, right? <laughs> All right, this is the reason we are here, right? right? 100%. All right, so the first person I'm going to welcome on stage is Deputy Director General Beth Bechtel. I think she's here. Where is, where is Beth? Ah! I'm actually a really big fan of her. So Beth, she says she wants more. She deserves more. So Beth, welcome to the stage. Thank you so much for being here. Happy to see Good you. To see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How are you this morning? Good? All right. Well, it's such a pleasure to be with you um, here at the opening of the Youth Assembly. I will just share with you that now that we've done this event for three years, um, I'm really big fan of science and innovation. I'm a really big proponent of investment. But this group is my favorite. Hands down, the work that we're doing, bringing together all of you inside this jam-packed, exciting, filled week at FAO is, I think, the most special and really the most important contribution that this week has to make for the work that we're doing to transform agri-food systems. So it's great to be back. Thank you to everybody, the organizers who have been kind enough to let me come back uh, to meet and to talk with each of you. This particular session that we have uh, moving today is especially important. It's really so critical that you are here demonstrating your leadership to us. You've already demonstrated that you are change makers, you are entrepreneurs, you are innovators, and just by virtue of you being here, caring about the topics that we're here to discuss, tells me that you all are leaders. And you have proven time and time again that you are the generation that can change the course of where we are today. This is so critical in a moment where we have to do more together to deal with the pending climate crisis. And I say pending and I shouldn't even say that because it's here. It's here, it's real, it's scary, it's threatening, it's disruptive, and we have got to do more together to make sure that we are taking action. You have already started global movements. I've seen them, I've heard about them. They're coming from all parts of the world. And this space of addressing climate action is really at the core of this year's World Food Forum. It's going to take technology, it's going to take science, but it's also going to take things like advocacy, communication, and accountability. So you're here getting started this week, please, be loud, be seen, be visible, make sure that every person who is in this building this week, whether they're here to interact with youth, they're here to talk about cutting edge science, or they're here to make really critical investments in their national food agri-systems plans, they need to see you and they need to hear you. Our current agri-food systems, and we, when we talk about agri-food systems at FAO, we mean everything in food and agriculture, right? We mean farming, we mean harvesting, we mean processing, we mean storing, and even ways that we consume our food. And in this space, there is so much more that we need to improve. Our current agri-food systems are not delivering in the way that they need to. It's just that simple. And we are seeing so many people facing hunger and malnutrition at levels that are clearly unprecedented, with sometimes not a lot of hope in how we are going to get those trends reversed. 
We have to get the data to turn back around. And so that means we have to work together to make these systems more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. And all of that has to be buttressed by this commitment to really address climate action. What can we do though to empower you? What can we do as leaders and organizations like FAO to make sure that you have all of the tools that you need to be more empowered and to be more active? And I know one of the things that we're going to, I hope, discuss in this morning session is making sure that you have meaningful places to actually communicate, play a role in translating climate policy and discussions into meaningful action. These policies really need to be our foundation going forward, and they have to be policies that give all of you solid platforms and support to launch real solutions. So how can we encourage and support you to do more? One, we have got to have you continue to advocate for climate action. You have to speak your truth. You have to tell how committed you are. You have to say the planet needs to change. You have to say that grown-ups have to do better. You have to say that national governments can't be one-sided and think solely through an individualistic, one-size-fits-all mentality. You have to say these things. These can come through campaigns, they come through conversations at your universities, they come through conversations on social media, but these statements have to get stronger. You saw it if you were there a little bit yesterday in the opening session. There are a lot of speeches and a lot of comments that take place inside not only this building, but the entire UN system that are a bit, let's say, muted. They're, they're, they're pretty polite in a lot of cases. Sometimes we need to find those ways to still show respect, but say things more strongly than we normally would. And so speak with strength when you raise awareness and hold the rest of us accountable for our commitments and for our action and keep pushing us to do more. So I encourage policymakers as well, when we have a chance as FAO leadership to speak with decision makers, to speak with ambassadors, to speak with permanent representatives and, and all of the other national leaders that we have interface with, it's important for us to make sure that we remind them of how important it is to involve youth in everything that they're doing. The other point that I just want to make before I turn it over to the, to the speakers for the program is that it's also really important that we think creatively about new and different types of partnerships. This is, I think, while it sounds quite simple, logically, it's really not that easy to implement. It's hard to bring a lot of siloed stakeholders, sectors, demographics, constituencies together who have operated for decades in very traditional, very predictive, very predictable kinds of patterns. But now we need you, we need academia, we need civil society, we need governments, and we need the private sector. And Again, I've learned now being about three years here at FAO, that's putting a lot of people not in their comfort zone. There are a lot of people in this planet, in this system, who like to talk to people who, who look like them, who come from similar organizations to them. And this concept has to be broken down. We just can't afford to wait for small groups of individuals to find things that they can work on together, we have to sort of blow it up. We have to transform and change the way that these lines of communications work. So for example, this past year at the UN Water Conference, members of the World Food Forum contributed to some really important discussions on the actions that are needed to address the ongoing global water crisis. Finding these opportunities and these places to really come in and connect is critically important. Each of these uh, areas that we've talked about demonstrate that there are young innovators, and I'm excited that that's a topic too that is, is threaded throughout this entire session. And with the right kinds of tools, the right kinds of networks, I think there are many of us that can build these bridges, provide mentorship, and have more of these kinds of exchanges together. 
And like I said, public-private partnerships that support innovation hubs and incubators and foster entrepreneurship and technological advancements in agriculture, these are also the kinds of things that we need more of. So all of you are bringing your own very unique perspectives, your unique history, your family background, your cultural background, your values, your beliefs, your, your curiosities, the things that you know, and I hope you still know, you have a lot more to learn. Don't think that you know it all now because there is a lot more to come and some of it will be really messy. It will be really complicated. It won't make much sense. But this type of exchange and conversation and so many of you from all the countries that you're representing, getting this time together is game changing. And that's what I'm so excited for the start of this week and to be able to be with you. I really do hope that each of you just grasps this opportunity that's here. It is. I have a 22 year old daughter. There are a lot of nights on phone calls with a lot of anxiety and a lot of trepidation about what's coming in the world. <sighs> Square your shoulders up, take some really deep breaths, spend time with people who you are getting to know, who you haven't met with, engage in these conversations, immerse yourself in these topics, commit to learning the details. Don't just sort of assume and gloss over and think that you know it all. And because one person said, reach inside, study these topics, learn about them, get both sides, listen to both sides. Social media is a challenging space to operate in. I never know which side of a social media platform I'm on. Am I in the space where everybody says the same thing that I do? Or am I finding myself in the space where I disagree completely with everybody's, you know, that I'm reading? Somewhere you have to find time to be in both. You really do, and you won't always like it, and it won't always be easy, and it won't always be comfortable, but it's what's needed if we're really going to make the kinds of differences. And for us, we say to transform agri-food systems, to really make this world a better place because agriculture can do this. I believe it firmly for all of the times that agriculture has been viewed as part of the problem, there are a lot of things that are moving in the right direction to change the way we grow, produce, manufacture, process, protect all of our natural resources and the way that we grow food in this world. And I hope that you remain optimistic and supportive about how we do all of that together, all ensuring that we take as best care of this really important planet that we live on. So I wish you all the best. I look forward to seeing you uh, through the rest of the week. And I'm going to go ahead and I think with that, turn it back over to uh, Rachel. So please give her another warm welcome. Thank you so much, DDG, man. So good to see you as well. All right, everybody. I just want to say one, one quick thing. Thank you so much, DDG, for creating these meaningful spaces for us that you speak, spoke about, and to the World Food Forum as well, for encouraging us to speak with strength. I think that's important, right? All right. As you rightly pointed out, Young people are the future, but they are also the leaders of the present, which is right now, right? Which is why we're here. In line with that, I would like to invite to the stage, drum roll, please. You're supposed to do a drum roll. Somebody's not drumming. There we go. Fantastic. I would like to invite to the stage an amazing and diverse panel of speakers who are actively advocating in various policy spaces and driving change around the world. As they make their way up, please join me in welcoming our moderator for this panel who has been working incredibly hard, Diana Zumroska, a dedicated member of the World Food Forum Youth Policy Board. There you are. <laughs> I was like, where is she? <laughs> Hi, Thank Diana. You. Welcome, 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 welcome. All right, and the distinguished panel of experts, I'm going to have them come up from Aya Munir, the one and only, focal point of Yongo Food and Agriculture Working Group. Come on up, Aya. Yes, you can. Ha -ha. Thank you so much. Shriya Venkat, World Food Forum Youth Policy Board member, and David Giles, former Irish UN Youth Delegate, to the stage. Welcome, guys. Thank you. So, okay. 
have a fantastic panel. See you in a bit. Hello, everyone. We're really happy to welcome you today at our first session. And we were talking together with our amazing uh, youth leaders about how we can create inclusive space for young people to participate in agri-food policy making. And and today we will start with uh, Shreya. Uh, please tell us about your work with Nest for uh, us and how you're working to represent uh, to help underrepresented communities to participate in policy making. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me here. Hi, everyone. I'm Shreya Venkat. I am a World Food Forum Youth Policy Board member um, representing the North America region. And in this capacity, I'm helping to co-create the North America uh, regional assembly which is focused on domestic school nutrition policy as well as the sdg2 thematic assembly which is focused on the progress review of zero hunger i'm also the founder and ceo of the nonprofit nest for us which tackles over 14 sustainable development goals through a dual approach of awareness plus action and in just seven years we've been able to grow our organization to over 7,000 volunteers of all demographics who all together have contributed over four million dollars in value of volunteer hours impacting tens of thousands in over 30 countries with all that being said it didn't come easy when i first started my organization i was just a 13 year old girl with such a big dream to change the world it can seem kind of intimidating at first right but you know i've realized you know as the years have gone on i've oftentimes the only young person in these big decision-making spaces. And that can make you feel small, sometimes even insignificant at times. And for example, um, I went to a conference, a high-level conference, and I was handing my business card and connecting with one of the keynote speakers. And she took one look at it. She was about to pull out her card, looked at me again, and was like, I don't wanna waste my business card on you. And that hurt, you know? And that made me feel even more invisible. So I wanted to ask all of you, have any of you ever felt um, unseen, unheard, unaccepted just for being who you are? Raise your hand if you have. Exactly. Well, I didn't let that stop me and it sure shouldn't stop any of you as well. Instead, it should give you greater purpose to ensure that this never happens again to you, to me, to any of us on stage, any young person in the world should never have to feel this way but we can't do this alone. It takes all of us. And I believe that leaders in all sectors should facilitate intergenerational dialogue, ensure equitable resource distribution, and design policies comprehensively that include each and every one of us. And it's really, really important to remember that we shouldn't tokenize underrepresented communities by having them in the room simply to check a box, but instead deploy strategies that take into account the, their values and causes that they truly care about. After all, it's not a matter of numbers, it's a matter of mindset. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for highlighting. Thank you so much, Shreya, again, for highlighting the importance of actually representing people from marginalized and unrepresented communities in the space of policymaking. And uh, David, let's turn back to you. Uh, can you please tell about, about your experience working as an Irish uh, youth delegate to the UN, uh, and also share about some of the most rewarding tasks during your experience at the UN? Thank you. So much. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me talk. My name is David Giles. And... Hello. There we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is David Giles. It's a pleasure to meet you all and to be to share this space with all of you, such a dynamic space. Um, so for the past year, until very recently, I was one of Ireland's youth delegates to the United Nations. So this was um, a process that we've had in Ireland for the last eight years, whereby two young people join the delegation to various UN conferences and act as a voice for young people in Ireland in policymaking. It has been an incredible experience. It's been incredibly insightful in that I've gained exposure to these spaces which can feel so far away from young people, even though there are access routes and there are ways to participate, but it's just a matter of finding these spaces. Um, it's been incredibly impactful in that I've met so many young people, um, both in Ireland and further afield, to continue to inspire me in my work um, and give me hope and direction. Um, and also, I've Although it's been overwhelming at times seeing the extent of the problems in the world, it's also been very motivating because I see the value in spaces like these and I recognize the privilege of being able to share spaces like these um, and what can come from that. Some of the highlights from, from my term, um, so first and foremost, I co-authored with my co-delegate Jessica Gill 
the first youth chapter to feature in any voluntary national review internationally, which was quite significant. For those that mightn't be aware of the high level political forum process, it's the SDG accountability mechanism set up under the auspices of the Economic and Social Committee of the UN, whereby countries can come forward and they can present their progress on the SDGs. And never before had there been a youth specific assessment on the SDGs. And I think it was quite significant that we, Jessica and I, were given the opportunity to write this chapter because in doing so, the government were really opening themselves to criticality and to constructive progress. And through that, I think there was a great learning experience for, for all of us. Um, and as well as that, I've been working on um, exciting initiatives here with the World Food Forum um, to expand youth governance structures for the Rome based agencies as a whole. And um, I'm excited to, to really use the, the passion um, that is here to, to further youth voices at the Rome based agencies. Great, amazing, David. Uh, thank you so much. It's also important to highlight the uh, necessity of representing young people at such global platforms. Uh, Aya, uh, tell us about your work with Yango and also your work you're doing with Food and Agriculture Group. And maybe also tell about uh, how you uh, feel about the importance of actually representing people, young people in a climate negotiating process. Yeah, thank you, Diana. Good morning, everyone. I want to take a few minutes to empower and congratulate our friends and colleagues from the World Food Forum for organizing this event. We can all give them a round of applause. Yeah, so I'm the contact point for the Food and Agriculture Working Group within Yongo, which stands for the Youth and Children Constituency to the UNFCCC. So what we do is we gather youth that are interested in the food and agriculture sector, doesn't matter their background. We have some groups and platforms and mailing lists where we share information, we share relevant opportunities about events, about competitions, etc. But we mainly follow negotiations in the food and climate sector. And we, for now, we follow the Sharma Sheikh joint work on implementation of climate action, action on agriculture and social security. We follow the negotiations during SBs and also during COPs. For the moment, we had different consultations, we had different hackathons, we, we drafted policy documents that we plan to submit and use as draft interventions when the negotiations happen. We also have the global youth statement where all the different working groups draft their call to actions and key priority asks, and we present them at the Conference of Youth, the COI, which happens just a few days before COP. Cool. Thank you so much. It's amazing also uh, to highlight the importance of participating youth also in climate change and negotiation processes. Okay, let's get back to you, Shia. Uh, can you also tell us about uh, how we can actually uh, make sure that young people not only represented, but also can uh, participate in decision making uh, in uh, agri-food policies? Yeah, I love that question. Um, so for young people, oftentimes the uh, lack of opportunity is one of the first barriers they face when working to achieve their goals and their dreams. But by providing this opportunity, it's actually a critical first step to ensuring more inclusive representation in agri-food policy, uh, in agri-food systems transformation. And, you know, how, how does opportunity help transform that? Well, first and foremost, opportunity represents the power of agency. It's the forging a path where people are given that choice to decide how they want to produce and acquire different resources, while also taking into account their personal values, their cultural beliefs, uh, and their specific needs, while also ensuring an equitable distribution of accountability, which is really, really important. And it's the power to have a seat at the table, not just an invitation to attend. Uh, opportunity also represents the power of uh, authentic connections. Uh, through my nonprofit Nest for Us, we've been able to redistribute over two million pounds of surplus food, uh, equating to over $3.4 million in value of meals donated. But how? I mean, it seems so massive, but it's honestly through the multi-sectoral collaborations with the public, private, civil society sectors, all working together and believing in the power of young people to drive this transformative change. Whether on the ground through equitable resource provision or skills building or in policy through prioritization and integration of community voices in these big decision-making spaces, connection is absolutely crucial. And lastly, opportunity represents the power and possibility of doing something, something real, something tangible, and something impactful. There are so many young people out there who are doing such fantastic work, 
but just due to this lack of opportunity, they're not able to take their ideas to the next level and turn them into a reality. But today we can change that. And it starts with each and every one of us. At the end of the day, transforming change can only happen when an, the opportunity exists for each and every individual in the community food system, from producers, consumers, and everyone in between to make a sustainable contribution in the way of their choice. So I ask all of you, I leave you all today with this question. How will you go back to your communities and take back agency, authenticity, and possibility to your own community food systems? Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Ria, again, for your work with Nest for Us. And I think that's amazing to highlight that you actually help people from underrepresented and underrepresented communities to actually participate in decision-making space. Thank you so much again for your work. Uh, David, uh, let's get back to you also. Uh, driven for your experience as a former Irish delegate to UN, can you please uh, tell us how can countries actually better leverage and support the potential of youth work in spaces, uh, such youth spaces, and also to help them to participate in policy, agri-food policymaking? There we go, got it this time. Um, thank you so much. So I think one of the first things that we can look at is the platforms that exist. I think when we look at designing platforms, we need to make sure that we are narrowing the distance, the hierarchical distance between those that have the decision-making capacity in terms of access to resources, access to finance, and then the young people who wish to, to take that and make a difference with it and amplify those resources. I think it's incredible to think that we have um, a DDG here is willing to listen to young people and young people can there is this interaction that is happening which if you look at the, the hierarchical nature of so many international organizations it's almost unthinkable that we would have these sorts of engagements so we need to have more and more of these spaces i think we need to support localized grassroots movements um, we need to decentralize the powers of structure that can sometimes gatekeep access to these spaces um, so that young people no matter how small their project may seem to be that that is recognize as significant in of itself and recognize for the potential of its change. Um, I think going back to the piece of being meaningful in our engagement, we need to recognize young people as experts in their own lived experience and experts in the spaces that they navigate. And in doing so, then we can bring them to these spaces, recognizing what they can contribute. Um, and then finally, I think we need to be open to the transformative change that is both inevitable and absolutely necessary. Um, we heard yesterday from um, His Excellency, the King of Lesotho, about um, a systemic failure of the agri-food system. And if we're to address a system, it needs to be an all of society-wide approach. We need everyone in all of our countries to see the value in the World Food Forum and what's happening here. We need to change the international financial system to address the global inequities. We need to have science and innovation and young people and primary producers at the center of what's happening. Um, and I think we also need to have faith because it's very easy to to lose faith and feel hopeless in the face of um, everything that's happening in the world. But the more we can engage with people who are like-minded and see, see that ambition to change the world, um, the more faith we can have. Great, thank you so much, David. Let's not lose hope. And I think, thank you for your work with uh, representing youth in such global platforms. And I also, uh, can you please uh, highlight maybe some of the successful stories from your work with Yango and also what are the priorities for young people um, in a lead up for the COP28? Yeah, so I can start Diana by saying that to be here as a Yango delegation is already a success. We are here and we'll be organizing one of the thematic sessions on Thursday on the road to COP to gather input from all of you. So we'll, I welcome you to join. What I want to highlight, and I must say I'm really proud of, is uh, the open letter we sent to the COP28 president on the, on the Earth Day, on the 22nd of April, where we asked for sustainable and climate-friendly food at COPs, because we should start by ourselves when we discuss food, agriculture, and the climate. And on the 17th of May, where we've received a positive response from His Excellency Dr. El Jaber, where he expressed that they align their interests with ours. And you can already see now that there is already an event scheduled at COP that's called the food we eat at COPs. And you can already see that on the website, you already have the menus that are mostly plant-based with climate-friendly, locally sourced food, and also with affordable food in terms of pricing. I can also say that if you already heard of the Emirates Declaration on the resilient food systems, climate, uh, sustainable agriculture and climate action, we have a young representative that gives inputs and comments to their declaration that are really welcomed even by Her Excellency Maryam. Uh, 
and it's taken into account and we saw differences and changes in the document and that's a success for young people to see that the presidency is taken seriously what we ask for. Great, thank you so much, Ayo. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for uh, being today here and talking about your experience and actually making uh, happen uh, and inclu making inclusion for young people in the space of policymaking, agri-food policymaking. Thank you again. Honestly, if the world is in their hands in the future, I feel like we're in good hands. So now you guys are going to have the privilege of seeing a video highlighting this year's upcoming Youth Assembly. Today I'm going to invite to the stage the talented, the one and only Mpiwa, a young singer. You guys have probably seen her already. She wrote this year's World Food Forum Anthem, which is now my ringtone, no big deal. <laughs> and today she's going to be honoring us with a short performance. So get your bodies warmed up, everybody stretch up, a little shake. Okay, good. Mpiwa, come to the stage, sis. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> It's a lovely face. Well done, everyone. Well done. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Yeah, well done for being here. Well done for waking up. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Today, as Rachel said, we're going to be warming up. It's going to be a nice interactive experience for all of us. And well done to all the speakers that have come before to showcase the work that they're doing. Um, I hope that, yeah, you have like a wonderful time. Loosen up, okay? We're going to have a nice jam session over here, okay? And yeah, we'll be playing uh, track number six. Hey, 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 yeah, you know what's up, hey, hey. I think you should stand, inspire the rest, especially the people at the back. Hey, 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 yeah. Hey, 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 it's gonna be okay. Hey, look at Rachel. Oh.
breath there. So the song, the song is in Shona, the Zimbabwean language. It means dance, child. So when I say Tambamwa now, we need to dance, yeah? Okay, so let's clap. Hey, 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 hey. You got this vibe on you, you know what to do. Stepping one and two, don't lock up the jerk. I just got a workout, okay? So if I sound out of breath, that's why. Thank you so much, Mpia, for blessing us with that lovely performance. It's going to be stuck in my head all day. Hope it's going to be stuck in your head. <sighs> now that the mood has been set, I think it's a perfect time to bring up our keynote speaker, Karina Hawks, Director of the Food Systems and Food Safety Division at the FAO. Come on up, Karina. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. There's an expression, it's a hard act to follow. Um, I'm not even <laughs> going to try. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> but look, yeah, my name is Corinna Hawks. Ooh. I'm the director of the Food Systems and Food Safety Division here at FAO. And it is a true privilege uh, to, be, uh, to be here today. Um, it's been so fun already. It's just the perfect way to start the day. And uh, really, it is a privilege uh, to be an inspired already by the fantastic, just mind-blowing energy and, um, and intelligence and commitment. But look, I want to focus oh, the, I... a, a few remarks on youth who really don't have any kind of privilege. And I'm not suggesting you guys do. I'm just wanting to focus on some young people who really have tough backgrounds. Let me start with a story that's based on a lot of evidence. Let's call this 16 year old Rosa. Now, she comes from a poor background in a medium sized city. She goes to school every day, but she's too old to benefit from the school feeding program. So though she's from a very poor background, she gets a little bit of money to spend on food each day. But she doesn't like the food at school, nobody does. So on her way out of school, she's with her friends and she uses it to buy, and she is surrounded by street vendors selling snacks, unhealthy snacks and fried foods. She knows perfectly well, all her friends know it's not that healthy, but it's safe, it's affordable, it's tasty, and it's there. So every day she spends a little bit of money on this very, very affordable, unhealthy food. Goes home, 
does nothing to support her nutrition, which of course a 16 year old adolescent is very important. One day she goes into school and they find that they've started to sell some healthier snacks in the school. And that she sees people talking to the street vendors, trying to move them away. And she sees some pictures talking about healthy food. These are well-intended efforts to improve the food that she eats from the food system around her. But these adults who've been sitting in rooms designing these fantastic solutions never spoke to her. They never listened. They never bothered to speak to the people affected by these problems and give, gave them the space to innovate. And if they had, they might have realized that these kids know perfectly well what healthy food is. Communications campaigns are not going to work in this particular context. They might have found out that for, for Rosa and her friends, the act of social act of eating amongst peers is really important to young people. They might have found out that these young people have so little agency in their lives that choosing what snack to have with the little money they have is the only act of choice they get all day. So perhaps these policy solutions weren't that great. And as a result, they didn't work and they were pushed back on. And nor did they give the space to innovate. Just imagine if they'd spoken to young people in that setting and said, what might work for you? Let's get some innovation going. But they didn't bother. As a result, the solutions don't work. Is that going to lead to transformative change? No. I gave this example, but I could have equally given an example of a young farmer, a farmer who is passionate about, about farming, a farmer who wants to continue, has millions of ideas, is very entrepreneurial, but faces huge risks, low profitability, and no land tenure. No one comes to speak to him. Instead, they design their solutions about off-farm employment. As a result, he has to leave farming. Huge problems of youth unemployment, huge problems of urbanization, huge problems of lack of food security through lack of food production. We know these are problems in our food system, but they don't even go and bother speak to the young people who could actually bring ideas, bring innovations, tell us what technologies and resources they need and what access to finance is going to work for them. I could have given you an example of a woman, a young woman who is pulled out of school when they're young because the family can't afford to send the brother and the sister to school in a rural area, who has to spend a lot of the time in the summer when the fruit is growing in the garden, preserving that fruit so they've got enough food for their food security in winter. It's an arduous task that is given to the young person, the young woman in the household, as is typical. And an aid agency comes in one day and says, I'm giving you this technology to speed up your processing and preserving of fruit. And that might mean you can sell some onto the market and start to make more money. Wonderful idea. But they haven't engaged with the young person and they hadn't realized that this particular piece of technology requires so much cleaning in order to prevent the bacteria and mold growing. It doesn't save the young woman any time at all. But did they come and create a space for that, for those, they, those families, those households, those young people to innovate their own technologies, to talk about what technologies would work for them? No, they didn't. I use these examples to indicate how our failure to listen to youth, our failure to create spaces for innovation means we are failing to transform our agri-food system. It's as simple as that. We need to listen and we need to create spaces to innovate. Now, it's easy for me to say that. And I have to say, I'm an, I'm an adult and it, we adults kind of like to think that we are supporting youth. We come onto stages, we say we've got to support young people. We mean it in FAO, I have to say we really do mean it. But let's face it, how many times have we come onto stage and said youth are agents of change? And then we create these spaces, we tick our box, and off we go. Nothing changes. How disempowering is that? 
very disempowering. So I am very conscious that we adults mustn't use you as an excuse to feel good about ourselves, just so we can tick a box and saying, hey, we're engaging with youth. So I'll ask you a couple of things. And Beth already said it. Keep us accountable. Make us walk the talk on what we say. And I know that's a lot of work for you, and I'm not handing the responsibility to you. I'm, we have the responsibility. But, the, but as Beth said, if you shout loudly, if you use your voice, you criticize us where necessary, you hold us accountable, we really need that. The other thing we need from you is go beyond just telling us you need to be involved. Give us some more a precision about how you need to be involved. And we've already heard some fantastic examples of that this morning. Because we, without that, we're simply not going to succeed in our journey of transforming food systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Hawks. We will be holding you accountable. Um, we appreciate the invitation to do so. All right, everybody, we are gonna move straight into our next panel. I'm really, really, really excited to introduce these wonderful people coming up. Everything she said seamlessly aligns with everything they're going to be talking about as well. So I'd like to invite to the stage, Ose Ehianeta Arhegan, UNA USA Youth Observer to the United Nations. Welcome, Ose. Thank you. Olivia Hengel, the World Food Forum Program Free Rice Project Manager. Welcome, Olivia. <laughs> Anna Aviles, World Food Forum Youth Assembly Lead, Youth Action Track. <laughs> Anna, you're a star. Ah, big up Tony and Layla from Jamaica, Vice Chairman of the Jamaica Network of Rural Women Producers Youth Committee, and Taylor Quinn, founder of Tailored Food. Taylor, I see what you did there, Tailored Food, Taylor. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Have a fantastic panel. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. And afternoon and evening and all the other times for the folks online. I have the distinct pleasure of talking with this amazing panel of young people change makers who all have important organizations or initiatives that they're working on to make agri-food, agriculture life better for not only young people, but everyone. So we're gonna go around, everyone's gonna tell us a little bit about yourselves, a little bit about your organizations, and then some insights, wisdom, hard fought one lessons. Does that sound okay? Sound okay? All right, we're gonna start with Livia. Hello. Can you tell me a little bit about the Free Rice Program, the World Food Forum Challenge, and how your organization has helped raise awareness of food waste and impact of food security? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Livia Hengel. I'm the project manager for Free Rice at the UN World Food Program, which is the sister organization of FAO. This is the first time that we're participating at the World Food Forum, and it is such a pleasure to be here. I'm so inspired. It's just great to work on youth initiatives. We are the future, so um, thank you for having us. Uh, we've worked closely with the World Food Forum to come up with a food waste quiz, um, which you can play. There are QR codes around on the totems that you can see. There's also little rice grains floating around the screen, which are an homage to free rice. Uh, the idea of free rice is that we're a trivia game. As you answer questions correctly, you gain grains of rice. And it's really a community-oriented activity that you can do online. You can do it virtually from all over the world. We have half a million players that log on every month to play. Show of hands, who's played? Yeah, good yeah. to see. Uh, we're represented in almost every country in the world, and 50% of our players are young people. So free rice is really about the power of community, although each question is just 10 grains of rice, which is a small amount. By playing all together, we really are making an impact. Um, at the World Food Forum, we have a food waste quiz uh, and a food waste challenge to raise 100 million grains of rice. We have increased this challenge three times since we launched at the beginning of September because it's been so popular. Um, and now the last I checked, we were at 83% of our goal, 83 million grains of rice. Um, there are great prizes to be won. So please, after this session, if you go around, you can find us on freerice.com on the columns and you can join our challenge to help raise rice grains, help spread the word about the importance of food security and be part of our movement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Anna, hello, Anna. 
Can you tell me a little bit about the World Food Forum's Youth Toward Zero Food Waste campaign and how we as young people can affect change in food systems? Thank you, Jose, for this question, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. I'm Ana Aviles, and I'm part of the Youth Action Track here at the World Food Forum. We're honored to have you all um, here, and we look forward to spending the rest of the week with you. To me, um, our Youth Towards Zero Food Waste campaign is really a call to action. So often as youth, we're disregarded because of our age, we're reduced to a number and our capabilities and the unique perspectives that we bring to the table are often underestimated. And I think as we gather here at such a pivotal event, it's important to recognize what youth can offer and the way they can actually drive and transform our agri-food systems. The ethos of our campaign really centers around driving sustainable agricultural practices, ensuring and championing um, access to nutritious food for all, and ensuring also responsible consumption patterns. Our Youth Towards Zero Food Waste campaign, which is a collaboration with UN Rome-based agencies, we just heard about how we're collaborating with the World Food Program Free Rice. We're also collaborating with the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and of course, with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. We are working through a four-step approach, learn, act, track, and scale up. This holistic approach really ensures that we're able to actually do tangible action, not only at a local level, but also changing and transforming at a global scale. We, are, we start by learning how to perform and conduct a food waste audit, because finding the areas of improvement and what we can actually do ourselves actually ensures that we can drive tangible action, whether it is from starting a compost or an awareness campaign or a food sharing program, whether it's at your community, at your school, and in so many places, we're really trying to drive um, this local impact and transforming it into a global movement of youth. Thank you. I cannot wait to learn more. So, Tony Ann, hello. Hello. Mic check, mic check. Mic check. Can you tell me a little bit about the Jamaica Network of Rural Women? Who are y'all? What do you do? Okay, of course. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> I am the vice chairman of the Jamaica Network of Rural Women Producers, but today I'm also representing the Caribbean Network of Rural Women Producers. Pretty much we motivate and inspire our young rural women to drive their lives, their community, and not ultimately national development what we do is okay so i'll tell you a story just to get my nerves under control you got this okay girl. so i come from a very humble background from a very humble beginning and i wanted to be a movie star i my mother was a higgler though so she sold to all the local supermarkets local markets so i would go to the markets i'll sleep at the markets i'll sleep on concrete tables i'd bathe in the bathrooms and i'd just be like this is not glamorous this is not what i want to do I so want to be a movie star. I want to do exactly the opposite of this. So my whole life growing up, I, I want to be a movie star. I want to be a movie star. I'm never going to sell at the market. I'm never being a farmer. But little did I think that, you know, furthering your education means you have to have money to do so. I never thought of that part. Um, so when it was time to go to college, I told my mom, oh, guess what? I applied for this college, this college, this college, and this one, and guess what? I got accepted to all of them. So now, am I gonna be a nurse? Am I gonna be like a logistics person working at the Maritime Institute? Or am I gonna be an actress? You know, I wanna be a movie star. Um, so my mom said, unfortunately, you know, finances are tight but if you help me in the market then you just might be able to i didn't want it i didn't um but i started to visit the different farms in my community and little by little i started to be so inspired like i don't know if it's just me but it's like when you have your mother or your family and they tell you something, you say, it's just because it's my mom. So that's the reason why a lot of people will say, you tell her, please, because because I'm her mother, she's not going to listen. She's thinking, I'm thinking like a mother. So now I'm going to the different community farms and people are actually showing me. And the, so they call me Indian. So they will say, Indian, look at this. 
check this for me. So that the farmers would ask me to write their invoices. So I would watch how much money they get. They would ask me to count the money. I would walk past the farms. They would say, oh, come and help me plant. And I'm like, mm, this is not so bad. Today you'll see a seed. Tomorrow you'll see a plant. Next week, it's only greens. And I'm like, wow. And they're like, oh, yes, then tomorrow I'll see a farmer with a truck, a water truck. And I'm like, oh, nice. How did you do that? They're like, oh, my potato garden got me that. So I started seeing Benz and Ferraris and all that. And I'm like, OK, so I could get my degree. I could be a movie star. I could have this car, that house. So I started farming. My mother gave me my first start. I started on a lot. Um, and I planted cucumbers. I got not even one to eat but I was determined to try again. I tried again with potatoes, sweet potatoes, and it beard like money, but not Benz or Ferrari, but it did, it gave me a great lot. I was able to finance myself for my first year of college. And of course, you know what college I chose, right? No, remember I was gonna be a movie star, so I chose um, acting. So when I started my first year, I'm like, perfect. I'm now in college. I'm going to be a movie star. I'm never going to do agriculture again. So then I went in. I did my first year. But then when I started my first year, I realized, oh, to get your degree, it's four years. Where is the money going to come from for the second year? So right through my first year, I was still doing my farm. I was still growing my farm. I was still doing so much to finance myself for the four years through college. And then I realized this is so fun. I'm falling in love with it. I'm feeling so independent. I have my money. I grow from such a very humble beginning. Now I'm helping my mother. I'm helping my family. I'm doing so much for my community. Then I started my foundation and I started to do so much. And to hear how much you're doing, you will have to connect with Tony and Yes, you will have to. Now, Taylor, I don't don't know how you're going to follow that, but I can't wait to hear you try. <sighs> Tailored food. Do you have the same story? Did you also want to be a movie star? I, uh, yeah, I wanted to, I'm Canadian, so I wanted <laughs> to be an ice hockey star. Is, uh, okay, so tell me a little bit about your org and tell me a little bit particularly about how innovation plays into the work that you do. Yeah, so um, I'm still reeling from what Karina said earlier. So thank you for your remarks and, and Beth as well. Um, because when we talk about food and agriculture and here at the World Food Forum, we often talk about food and agriculture at a very high level. But yeah, when it comes down to what choices is a young person making when they're purchasing food every day? And that's the question I've been obsessed with for the last seven years. So seven years ago, I moved to Liberia in West Africa during Ebola. I was 22. I didn't know much about anything, um, but I became obsessed because I was talking with pediatricians who explained to me, they said, look, I feed kids what gets donated to my hospital, but kids are dying of malnutrition. And there's nothing that the big nonprofits are doing about it because they're treating malnutrition, but nutritious, low cost food doesn't exist in local markets. And so for the last seven years, I've been obsessed with this, uh, first in Liberia and now in 18 countries across, uh, mostly in Africa, but around the world, where I research, develop, and take to market nutritious, low-cost food products, working with partners like UNICEF, working with partners like the World Food Program, Save the Children, companies like Unilever, because at the end of the day, we don't like to talk about it, but it's really the private sector that runs the food system. Unfortunately, most of us in this room do not run the food system. It's the private sector and we need to work with the private sector. And so fermented and, and flavored uh, porridges in Liberia, banana leaf wrapped protein bars in Congo, plant based ground beef in Brazil, uh, nutritious teas in Somalia, uh, nut butters in Mozambique. Um, but I think the big thing is how do you really localize production? How do you focus on Maybe it makes more sense to produce off the grid if electricity is more expensive than hand cranked machines. Can you work with motorcycle mechanics to build equipment? You know, all these questions that are really important. Can you use banana leaves rather than plastic and packaging? And then, gosh forbid, can we actually convince the World Food Program that a product in a banana leaf can be safe? And the answer is yes. You know, these things are possible. And so I'm really excited to, to have this discussion and continue to scale up my work. Thank you. Thank you. Now, to close, you've all shared so much about your wonderful organizations. This is not the end of this conversation. Hopefully, it's the beginning. Please go look up everyone's phenomenal organizations that we've learned about today. You each have 30 seconds. 
I will time you. Please give me just a short word of wisdom from the hard earned success that you've had as a young person working in agri food. What advice do you have to the young folks that we have watching in terms of things that have gone well for you, things you wish you had known, or a short success that you want to share in order to inspire someone to keep going? We're going to start with you, Olivia. Hi, um, I think, well, I'll take inspiration from free rice. I would say creative approaches and thinking outside the box. It sounds, maybe we say this a lot, but I think um, there's so much space in digital innovation and platforms and sharing your story in creative ways. And I just think to try to, I don't know, really think outside the box is important for solving the problems that we have today because their new problems are always evolving and we're not going to solve them by thinking in the same schema that we've been sort of taught. So really letting yourself be creative with finding solutions would be my my tip. Amazing. Thank you. Anna. Really quick, I'll give a little bit of a backstory. I'm originally from Honduras. I grew up there. I spent my entire life there. I was a little girl that would always say, why? Why am I treated different? Why don't I have the opportunity just because I'm a girl, just because I'm from Honduras? Why? I don't understand. Little old me decided to go to college here in Rome. Um, and last year, my university gave me the opportunity to be a delegate here at the World Food Forum. I was in love with everything that the World Food Forum was doing. I was so impressed by the work that they were doing, how they were empowering youth, how they were driving change. And now a year later, I'm part of the team. So I will say, don't feel like you're dreaming too big. Don't feel like you can't achieve what you want. There's a way. If you have passion, if you really care for what you're doing, you'll be able to get anywhere. We got to clap for that. <laughs> Period. Thank you. I echo the sentiments of my fellow speaker, and that is my point. Coming from a young rural girl who has nothing and has big dreams. Agriculture has paved the way for me. And I'm so grateful to be the youth chairman now of the organization. I get to give little girls and pave the way, be that motivation, that inspire. Because sometimes, most times, what we find is that people who are producers or in agriculture, they feel so discouraged, not only because of the wages, but because people see agriculture as dirt, a dirty job or for someone who's uneducated. So it, it gives me this drive and this passion and our organization finds so much purpose in going and making sure that every rural girl has a voice, have a drive, and we find great purpose in that. And we're very grateful for events like these, giving young rural girls like myself the opportunity and the exposure to be here in Rome and to be here at the FAO. Thank you. All right, Taylor, take us home. OK, um, to, yeah, hard acts to follow here. But um, a bit of a maybe controversial opinion. But I, uh, a couple years ago, got my dream job here in Rome at the World Food Program. And then came to realize, after spending a while building a new little team at, at WFP, that I could actually create more change outside of the UN system. And to be honest, I am tired right now. I do not have the capacity to work in 18 countries. There are not enough good young people, really, whether inside the UN system or outside, creating a better food system at a grassroots level. So if you're running a small organization or if you want to, I will help you. I will help you find funding. I will mentor you. Please help us build a better food system. We need people who are taking real action, both inside the big institutions and outside them. Thank you. Okay, and for everyone who heard that and is thinking, excuse me, Taylor, I have an organization. I am a young person. I am doing it. Please find him. Find him after this. But let's give it up one more time for our panel. All right. Thank you all so much. Finding Taylor immediately. Thank you, youth, for this awesome panel. And thank you, Ose and Ose's shoes. I hope you guys saw the amazing, amazing job. All right, we're going to move swiftly, swiftly along. It's OK, no worries. We're going to move swiftly along to, I guess, our last speaker of the day, or almost our last speaker of the day. So also, I want to invite you all to join the Youth Towards Zero Food Waste campaign. Help us raise awareness and promote education by joining our mission in the fight against world hunger, one that we are very passionate about. 
Now I'd like to welcome the former UNA USA Youth Observer to the United Nations, Youth Leader and 2023 Y20 Delegate, Cynthia You welcome. <laughs> So before I begin, I just want to thank all of our incredible speakers at here today at the Youth Assembly and the World Food Forum team for hosting this incredible event. Today, policies from above shape much of our food systems, whether these policies are tightening climate caps, injecting funds into our research for food innovations, or providing food aid assistance to our neighbors abroad, policies impact people. And yet, despite being some of the greatest stakeholders in today's decisions, our generation is constantly left out of the policy-making space. And that drives us to the crux of the puzzle. How do we build bridges for intergenerational dialogue and deliberation to reshape our food systems? Today, I'm filled with gratitude to stand here as a youth leader to announce a historic advancement in the food policy-making space. This past summer, I had the incredible opportunity to work with the World Food Forum's action team to create a first of its kind chance for youth around the globe to create and present their food systems policies to international leaders and policymakers. The World Food Forum Policy and Deliberation Challenge. Throughout my time as a youth leader, I've spoken with thousands of youth who have told me that they want a chance to hold the reins themselves, a chance to speak truth to power in policy spaces. The World Food Forum's Policy and Deliberation Challenge will be exactly this, giving our world's youth a platform to transform our thoughts for food into food for thought. It will be more than just a space to incubate ideas. It will be the world's premier platform to bring youth ideas on food systems to the policy making table. This will look like drafting policy plans on the future of food systems, and this will look like thoughtful global policy deliberations. This will look like presentations delivered from youth to UN officials, and this will all take place right here at the World Food Forum. As young people, our value lies in our inherent worth as human beings and as the inheritors of our planet. We don't need a title, a plane ticket, or a diplomatic passport to make change. We just need to be heard. The UN is no longer a giant complex in New York City, gated off from the public and budding future leaders. The World Food Forum is creating a space where everyone everywhere will have a chance to be policy change makers. Join us as we launch the World Food Forum Policy and Deliberation Challenge in 2024 and scan our QR code here, which will take you to the World Food Forum's Youth Policy Action page, where you'll get to see live updates on everything the Youth Action Team is doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia, for your hard work. Hopefully everybody scanned already. Celebrate good times. So excited for that. Next, I would like to welcome Tess Hayton and Vikrant Srivastava. Stava, sorry. <laughs> Just so you know, they're youth policy board members of the World Food Forum. Welcome, guys. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here today at the opening of the Youth Assembly 2023, an event that builds on the work of the World Food Forum over the past three years. This year, we're hosting six regional assemblies and six global assemblies. Each region has chosen a policy priority from the compendium in 2022, and my colleagues and I have spent the past few months consulting with young people, working hard to hear their uh, thoughts and perspectives on these policy issues. So over the next few days, the six regional assemblies will summarize these findings and provide a platform for young people to engage in discussion and share their experience and exchange ideas with their peers and their high, and high level experts. So our program also includes thematic assemblies covering COP28, SDG2, SDG2 progress, agrobiodiversity, land, drought, desertification, UNEA6, and the UNFS stock taking moment. Thank Please. you, Test. Uh, along with a round table of indigenous youth and young farmers, these assembly will play a vital role in shaping our action, engagement strategy, and the sustainable transformation of our food system. We invite you all to join us in translating policy into action, to actively participate 
in creation of our global action plan for 2024 and depend your understanding for a critical policy matters. We look forward to having you with us throughout the journey. I'm looking forward to it as well. Thank you so much, Tess and Vikrant, for those well powerful words and a powerful call to action. To close us off, I want to welcome back to the stage Deputy Director, Director General Beth Bechtel. Thank you guys, you've been an awesome audience. We'll see you in a bit. Thanks very much, Rachel, and um, what a powerful session. I'm, I'm not sure that I even know how to wrap this up, and wrapping it up is certainly not going to be with the comments that are in the teleprompter in the back, because uh, they don't actually feel quite as uh, personal and as connected to, I think, each of you who came up here on this stage and shared some incredibly um, strong uh, and incredibly personal messages of your own. Let me just share. I've 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 come uh, just back from a uh, really intense, uh, really surreal, and really powerful week long visit to Afghanistan. I just got back on Sunday night. Um, I'm still feeling a bit of the jet lag, still feeling a little bit of the trying to compute and process all of the things that I saw and did there, um, but. Um, I, I think uh, the question was asked earlier, and and Karina mentioned it as well. This um, you know the, this this feeling of recognizing that there are people in the world who really are not seen. I don't know that you can find circumstances anywhere more complicated than in a country like Afghanistan, where certain people um, are are forced to not be seen. Um, it's really, really discouraging and saddening and just emotionally draining uh, to be in a place like that where there is so much need, so much attention to food and agriculture, actually so much potential for food and agriculture, and to see women and young girls who are now completely and totally out of sight. And as we would travel over the course of the week, I would find myself as I would get out of the big UN convoy, you know, cars and trucks and, you know, guards with AK-47s everywhere around you. So a little bit of anxiety around that. And you'd see these children in these villages. And all I could think about was what, what are they going to be able to do? Will they get to be a movie star? Will they get to form their own company? Will they even get a chance to go to school? Will they have enough people around them, loving them and supporting them? And uh, it's, it's a little um, hard to sort of say probably with some realism that very few of them are going to have those kinds of opportunities. So I just want all of us to not end on a spirit of, of sort of despair or a, a feeling of, of um, uh, sort of difficulty, but in every story that each of you presented, I'm, I'm so amazed and proud of each and every one of you who are here, who are doing incredible things in each and every way that you are as individuals, with your networks, with your communities, you're building communities, you're reaching out and you're grabbing, but please, 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 in everything that we're doing, let's keep these individuals in our hearts, in our minds, front of mind, thinking about that as really our end goal, our ultimate goal is making sure that every person, a small little girl in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, who I took more pictures of because she was just adorable. I want her to be sitting in this room in 15 years. 
I may not be here. Many of you will have moved on to really amazing and impressive professional accomplishments. You'll be running the FAO. You'll be running new corporations. You'll have amazing opportunities in your own lives. But these are the next generation. When we talk about youth, I'm, you know, the director general always says young at heart. I'm, I think I'm, I'm officially now in that category. You are truly the youth, but we've got to be thinking about these little ones as well. Um, they have to have the same kinds of opportunities and the same kinds of support, love and encouragement uh, that I think it sounds like many of you have been afforded and many of you have fought for. And that is, I think, the spirit of what we are really trying to show here this week. So with that, thank you so much for sharing your personal stories your your tenacity your courage your bravery your pick yourself up you get tired taylor i know i i am tired too on lots of days but it is so worth it everything that we are talking about here it's necessary but it's so worth it so keep it up Stay with us. I can't wait to see more of you over the course of the week. Thanks so much for sharing your stories, for inspiring so many people who have been a part of this World Food Forum. You've made it what it is in this third year, and it's got so much more potential. So with that, I think we need to close. And uh, we've got more sessions. We've got a lot more exciting uh, in t content and a lot more ahead of us. So I hope you'll stay. I know we've got a session coming coming up here in the Sheikh Zayed Center soon, um, but all over FAO. Thanks to all of you for being such great advocates for the work that we need to do to transform agri-food systems. Thanks to Karina, my dear colleague, colleague here at FAO, and to so many of our other um, FAO leaders, the Rome-based agency leaders who are really coming together, pulling together, to make this one effort and one event that really gives us all these platforms to do more together. So thank you very much. It's great to have you all with us. Thanks.